Good afternoon and welcome to Fish Hawk Live and the Great Lakes Fishing Podcast. This afternoon, it's the lunch hour of Fish Hawk Live once again. We're talking with Captain Lance Valentine from Teach and Fishing. Lance is a fishing educator, seminar speaker, author, and charter captain. Lance, welcome to the show. Hi, Chris. How are you, man? Just living the dream. Every day I wake <laughs> up and say, I can't believe this is how my life turned out. So <laughs> Hard to believe. Sometimes good, sometimes bad, right? <laughs> right, exactly. You get to sit around and talk fishing today at lunch, so I'm excited about that. Um, I gave you, a, gave everybody kind of a short uh, idea of what you are and who you, or, uh, who you are and what you do. Uh, can you uh, fill in the blanks for us and kind of give us a, your short bio and how, how you explain it? Yeah, so uh, you actually you actually did it pretty good. So I, I'm a full time charter captain uh, here in the Great Lakes, Detroit River, Saginaw Bay, Lake Erie are the three main uh, places that I fish. I do a lot of education, uh, a lot of seminars, which unfortunately we haven't been able to do uh, in person for the last uh, couple of years. So we cranked up uh, our Teaching Fish and Facebook page, we do a lot of stuff live there. Uh, I do a little bit of outdoor writing, do a lot of uh, education on the boat where we actually go in our boat or in other folks' boat and teach them how to use our electronics, uh, how to set their boat up, you know, rig rigging-wise for trolling or whatever they're going to do. So our whole life really basically focuses on education, trying to make people uh, better anglers. Been doing it for closing on 25 years now, uh, full-time since 2001. So, you know, 20 years full-time, 25 years uh, overall. So it's been, uh, uh, you know, a great little ride here. We talked a little earlier here, what uh, some of the changes we've seen in the industry and how we've had to kind of adapt to all that. And, you know, here we are again in another kind of change, but it's been, it's been really cool. So I get up every day and my main goal is to make sure that I help at least one person catch more fish that day. That's my whole goal. However, we have to do it, we do it. And it's a uh, pretty exciting uh, pretty exciting life because I get I get to be uh, I've actually become part of a lot of these people we teach. You become kind of part of their life, and they share their experiences with you and their successes and their failures, and uh, they keep asking questions. So we have people that have been coming to our seminars or been doing charters. Literally, we have people that I've known for 23, 24, 25 years through this, and they're still part of of what we do. So it's uh, uh, it's an education based business, but we're also building you know build a community, and and it's just you know, fishermen, as you know, are really, really cool people. So to have all these fishermen in my life and part of what I do every day is just, a, it's a, so I'll put it this way. It's a whole lot better than working at the bank like I used to do. So uh, I get up every day, get a chance to, to do what I love to do, hopefully make uh, somebody a better fisherman every day. And I don't know what else I, what else I could ask for. I am as, you know, as they say, living the dream. Yep. Uh, uh, you're, uh, you're a guy though. You put work into that. It's not something that happens overnight. I uh, <laughs> just want to want to say uh, hello to Larry and Dale joining in on the show on Facebook. And if any of you guys have questions for Lance, go ahead and put them in and we will get to those at some point here during the show. You talked about uh, your charter captainship and what you're doing there, but I want to talk more right now about kind of what you've got going on with teaching fish. And one of the things I love about you is the the coffee hour show that you do it's a, it's a live every week i call it the church of fishing and i think that's exactly what it is uh, how did that get started so when we originally started uh, our brand was originally walleye 101 and over the years uh we found out that you know that kind of pigeonholes us so a couple of years ago we made the brand change to teach and fishing because what we do isn't just basic walleye information. Everything that we teach applies to every everything that you fish for, no matter where you fish for it at. So the Teach and Fishing brand uh, kind of started about five years ago as a more generic thing of what we actually do with all of our education. Now, Coffee Hour um, is really neat. And it's hard for me to talk about Coffee Hour without getting a little emotional because uh, my life, January, February, March, I was on the road uh, usually between 75 and 80 days. January, February, March, going to all the shows, talking to people, being on stage, being in uh, a couple a couple places we do seminars are on inland lakes. So I'm actually in a boat uh, and basically a swimming pool. So my life is was very interactive. I got a chance to really get to know my people and shake hands and say hi. Uh, well, you know, obviously March of 20, you know, 2020 changed all that, right? And uh, we lost our last month of the of show season. I'm like, man. I've got to do something. Number one, I got to do something to keep me sane because as a person who loves being out in the public and talking to people, when you start to get to a point two, three, four weeks, even where you haven't seen anybody, you start to kind of go a little crazy, um, literally. And I knew that there were people that wanted fishing education. A lot of people 
a lot of folks in our business didn't really step up and make the change real quick. So I got up one day. I'm in my office right now, my studio. I have a, my office in the other bedroom, my studio here. This is, a, this is actually a house right next door to me is my actual residence. So I walked over one day, put my phone in a tripod, turned it on, went to Facebook Live and said, I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to sit here for an hour. We're going to talk. And that turned into coffee hour. That's kind of how we branded it because it was basically, it wasn't a seminar. It was just a bunch of guys sitting around like you would having a cup of coffee and talking about fishing. And by the time we got into the second week, we were getting 200, 250, 300 people. And most of them, I didn't know. It was a whole new group of people who were home looking for something and found us. And we did coffee hour 89 days in a row um, through basically April, May, and June of 20. 20. Uh, we got to go back fishing here. We were shut down. Fishing was shut down in Michigan. I don't know if a lot of people know that, but fishing was shut down, uh, specifically charter fishing for a long time. We didn't get a chance to go back charter fishing till late May. Uh, I lost a whole Detroit River season. So through that whole time, I wasn't fishing. When I started fishing, we kind of stepped back and we went to every Monday night because it was kind of hard to uh, do it every day when I had to do charters. But we went to every Monday night and that's where we are now. So we do a uh, about an hour, hour and 20 minutes every Monday night on our Facebook page. And it is just a conversation of fishing guys sitting around talk. We, we talk about fishing superstitions. We talk about what do you eat for breakfast? We talk about what do you take on the boat? We talk about, do you have a, a lucky fishing shirt? Um, all those types of things, your favorite memory of fishing. Uh, who, if you could go fishing with somebody one more time, who would it be? Uh, who would you like to go fishing with? What's on your fishing bucket list to go visit? It's just a conversation about fishing things. And, and it's just, it's really kind of fun. And I don't want to sound too dramatic, but if you, if you know me and kind of know how I operate, I'm not ashamed to kind of say that, you know, those 89 days when, when people were there every day, um, it was a big part in, in saving my life during the pandemic, because there were times with what I do and watching my business crumble and losing 87 charters on Detroit and watching everything you built kind of disappear uh, to be able to reach new people and continue to do what we do, even though it was kind of a little impersonal, man, at some days that was the only reason I got up was to come over here and do coffee hour. So it's a really special thing to me. Um, and I'm very thankful for the people who showed up and the people who continue to show up. So uh, we do it as 8.30 Every Monday night, uh, we'll switch to 7.30 when we switch off daylight savings times. But 8.30 on our, our Teach and Fishing Facebook page, we go live for an hour, hour and 20 minutes, and we just talk about fishing stuff. Um, you know, So we're still getting 100, 120 guys uh, during the week, and it's just something that I look forward to every Monday. It kind of gets my uh, – Monday is my day to do all my personal stuff, and then Monday night at coffee hour kind of kicks off my week of teaching fishing, and it's just a, it's just a fantastic blessing – um, you know, out of a tough time in 2020, good things happened. And uh, coffee hour is one of those things that I'm just so thankful for and all the people that came and we're just kind of keeping it rolling. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, you go on there even today, you've been doing it for a long time and you're getting, you know, 200 plus comments. And I mean, you're getting, you're definitely getting a ton of interaction with it. And uh, you, I would say you've definitely built a community there. And I think you, you kind of just went through some of the reasons why you do it and why it's important and why it's good. Um what about some of the challenges? What are some of the challenges that go into to doing something like that? So, you know, for me, the, the biggest challenge is keeping people engaged when you can't interact with them. So um, we, when we built Walleye 101 25 years ago, we, we basically have four groups of people. So we have, you know, the old guard that kind of started with us. And that group, uh, we were hands-on with them, right? I would drive to their house and spend an hour and a half with them fixing their sonar. Um, they got a lot of special attention because we were trying to build a brand. Nowadays, you don't have the time to do that. And honestly, if you look at it, if you, if you stop and look at what we do from a business point of view, that kind of time doesn't really give you a return on investment that um, digital does. So the challenge for me, especially going digitally was I have a hard time, you know, when you do a seminar and you were at our, one of our events there in, in New York, when you're doing a seminar and you've got 50, 60, 80, hundred people in the crowd and I say something, I can see in their eyes that they get it or they don't. So I can go, oh, okay, I can move on. They got that. Or, uh oh, I got to back up and explain this a little bit better. Um, one of the challenges of working digitally is you don't know 
if somebody's getting it. So when we do our digital seminars or we do our, 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 our work, monthly workshops for our Angers Club uh, or even coffee hour, you can't, you don't get that interaction of, I got to talk a little bit more about this or I, you know, or they're bored about with this or I need to go on. Uh, you don't get that. And that's really hard for somebody like me who's, you know, who kind of really practiced my craft of being able to talk to people and, and kind of get that reaction back. Uh, when you don't see that, it's hard. Um, and the second thing is you just don't get the energy, right? You know, when you're in person and people want to see you, uh, for some reason, people want to come and watch me talk. I'm, all, I'm always amazed every time I do a seminar that anybody shows up. And I'm always amazed when someone comes back a second time. But uh, you get that energy from the crowd, right? You just you get that buzz and they want to learn and they want to listen. Um, that drives you to, to be better. So in a stale studio, you know, I'm looking at a camera, a couple monitors and a bunch of soundproofing stuff on my wall. You have to really become uh, not just a, an educator or a speaker. You have to really become an actor. Um, you have to kind of uh, build your own excitement, build your own juice, as they say. So that has probably been the biggest challenge is not being able to get the interaction, the energy back and trying to keep my level of energy uh, up without getting it back from the crowd. Yeah, we don't know what's going to happen at this point. I think a lot of people are, are planning on returning back to the shows. I know a lot of the show promoters have scheduled shows and kind of things are are pointing that way, but uh, we'll have to see what, how things progress here in the next few months. But uh, how, how much of this do you think will make you better at, at that job when you actually go back to doing this stuff? Yeah. In person? That's, an, that's an awesome question. Um, and I think a lot of it because... One of the things we do different at Teach and Fishing is we are not, I used to call it a sports of field uh, article or field and stream seminar, right? Uh, me and Joe went fishing and we hopped in our Lund boat and we drove our uh, Suzuki motor over here and we grabbed our Denali fishing rod and we cast our Rapala by the tree and we caught them on blue and silver Rapala. So go buy a bunch of blue and silver Rapalas. That's, that's what I call a field and stream seminar. That's what we don't do. Um, I may spend 45 minutes and talk about nothing but terminal tackle. Snaps, swivels, snap, swivels, and knots for 45 minutes, right? So we really dig deep, 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 deep into things. That's easy to do in person because you can kind of follow. That's hard to do digitally. So I think what this digital world is going to make me better at is being quicker, more precise, still giving the quality information, but not taking as long to do it. Um, having a tendency to kind of, you know, knuckle down because, you know, digital, even if you've got a, a great piece of information, digital attention span is maybe 20 minutes. Um, it's hard to get people to, to, to stick around more than 30 minutes. So I got to take all these seminars that I've been doing, adjust them digitally and get them done in 20 minutes. So I think that's going to be the positive I take from this is I'm going to be a much better speaker because I'm going to be much more precise on getting to the high points and then letting my customers where I can see them again in person, had the attendees kind of tell me by their expression where I need to spend more time as opposed to maybe spending time on things I don't because I want to spread this out over 45 minutes. So I think making me much more precise, um, you know, saying in 15 minutes, what I used to take 40 minutes to say, I think that's going to be the big thing for me is uh, much better, more precise seminars. And that leaves more time for questions. So uh, I think I'm going to be a better speaker when this is all done. All right. Speaking of questions, uh, we're getting a few, and I, I want to. I'm going to save a few for later in the show when we kind of get into more of that type of stuff. But uh, this one, I, I kind of like, and I think it's a good question for right now. It's from Rick, and Rick wants to know if there's a deep down secret that you've never told anyone about a technique for catching walleyes, except for maybe your best friend. That is an awesome question, Rick. Um, <laughs> that is an amazing question. Uh, I don't. I, I really don't have any deep down secrets. Um, I two two things I would tell you, and I think we'll cover this a little bit later. But you know, obviously, if I could teach anybody anything, fish where the fish are. That then that's a whole other subject for make sure you're fishing where the fish are. Uh, but Rick, if I could tell you one thing. Uh, that I think is a secret to becoming a better anger. And I, tru I truly believe this. Keep records of what you do every day and write down what works and what doesn't work. Because what happens with the better angers? Most people, I fished the professional walleye trail as a pro for five or six years. And what I found out was from the top to the bottom, 120 anglers, we could all fish, right? We could all catch fish. 
the thing that separated the guys at the top and the guys who were consistently at the top from the guys who were consistently in the middle and every once in a while snuck up, one of the guys like I was, their ability to take today's conditions and make good decisions faster. And that comes from having information every time you go fishing, dissecting what happened, why what worked worked, and asking why what didn't work, why did it not work, and knowing both of those things. So when you're faced with those conditions again, you know what to do. And more importantly, what a lot of guys forget is they won't write down what didn't work that day. But remember, if you're faced with the same conditions, you don't want to do what didn't work last time because it's probably not going to work again. So if I had a secret, uh, it would be spend more time gathering, maintaining, dissecting, and sorting out your information. Uh, so when things happen on the water, it's in your head. I've seen that before. It might have been three years ago, but I've seen that wind switch before. I've seen that water clarity switch before. Here's what worked. I'm going to go do that now. So have good information and trust your instincts. Those are the two things um, I would tell you. It's really not about secret lures or secret colors. I'm not, I'm not that guy, but trusting your instincts and having good records so you know you're making good decisions. I think those are the two things that make uh, poor anglers good, good anglers great, and great anglers fantastic. That's That's the difference. Yeah, I think trusting the instinct and, and actually executing on it. How many times do you hear guys go, yeah, we changed, but boy, we should have changed two yeah, hours earlier. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. Trust you, your, if you're on the water enough, trust your gut. I mean, your your gut is usually pretty good. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's just somebody giving you some kudos. Corey Brown says, uh, I've known Lance a long time. He teaches everything he teaches is applicable to anything or any way you fish. He continues to be a great ambassador for all things fishing. And I've watched Corey grow up. Corey came to my seminars with his dad for the first time years and years ago. He was still in high school. And now he's uh, he's not in high school anymore. <laughs> so you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, but uh, let's get into kind of the what, what I would call the pillars of what you teach, and that is uh, your eight steps. And uh, one of them you talked about just a moment ago, a location. And it's something I, I kind of got started in, in the hunting world. And I would always joke with people, you know, you're not going to shoot a, a Boone and Crockett deer if you're hunting in a place where there are no Boone and Crockett deer. So it, it's uh, locations key. But uh, I'll let you kind of go through yeah. your eight steps and, and what you do there. So uh, obviously I was prepared. See, I did my homework. Um, good. <laughs> when we started, uh, I knew that everything I, ta I taught had to have a place to kind of fit, right? Because um, because you get a lot of fishing information, you really don't know what to do with it. So so we came up with the eight steps. And if you have been around as long as I have, this is just an expansion of the old in fisherman uh, F plus L plus P equals S. Right, knowing the fish's nature leads you to where they have to be. Where they are dictates presentation. You do those three things right, you have success. So we broke it down to eight steps. So step number one is location. Step number two is how deep are the fish. Step number three is the depth of your lure. Step number four is lure speed. Step number five is lure size. Step number six is lure shape. Step number seven is lure action. And last is lure color. So we list those in order on purpose because number eight, lure color, which everybody thinks about, is totally irrelevant if it, the other things aren't right. You're not going to catch fish with the right lure if you're at the wrong depth. You're not going to catch fish with the right color if you're at the wrong speed. It's just not going to happen. So these are listed in order of importance. So we teach guys or anglers you know, start at the top. Are you in the right place? Yes. How deep are the fish? Well, they're X amount of deep. Okay, we got to get our baits above them, and then we can start working here. And you see that yellow line? We separate the top three, location, depth of fish, depth of lure. We call that the where. And then below the lines, lure speed, size, shape, action, color, we call that the what. So here's a statement I make. You can do every, we call this above the line and below the line. If you do everything above the line right, if you're in the right location, you know how deep the fish are, and your lures are above them assuming open water. If you do all three of these right, you can do all five of these below the line wrong and still get bit. But if you do everything below the line right, right speed, right size, right shape, right action, right color, and you get one of these wrong, you will catch nothing. So getting people to adjust to get the where right and then worry about dialing in the presentation as opposed to looking at your box and what's the super secret color today. And that's why when I when I answered Rick, I really don't have a secret. I would say what makes me successful is I am a really bad fisherman with usually the wrong thing, but I'm almost always in the right place. 
Um, you're much better off to be a bad fisherman with the wrong presentation in the right place than you are to be a really good fisherman with the perfect presentation in the wrong place. You alluded to it for hunting. So when I do a seminar, the way I teach it is this, right? Opening day of deer season coming up, you know, depending on where you live, I'm going to take you out to the farm, 400 acres mowed flat. I'm going to stick you right in the middle of that farm field. I'm going to put a blindfold on your on your eyes. I'm going to tell you to put a shell in your gun. And I want you to spin around in a circle. And at some point, just go bang, shoot. How many guys would expect to shoot a deer? That sounds ridiculous. That's how most guys fish. They drive out to a spot. They throw some stuff out. And they go, oh, that's not working. Let's change colors. And they go over here. And go. That looks like they don't take any time to think about, am I in the right place? Are my lures where the fish can see them? So everything we teach fits into one of these. Now, obviously, right, we're talking, I could break each one of those those eight steps down into 15 different sub-steps, right? You know, you know, lure speed, speed at your boat, speed over ground, speed at your fish hawk. Uh, what lures work inside a speed range. So there's there's lots of little pieces inside, but that's our eight major steps. And everything, every time you read an article or you watch a video or uh, you watch a TV show or you talk to an angler, you're going to get something that fits into one of these eight steps. Make sure you slide that piece of information where it belongs and always start at the top. If you're not catching fish, first thing you do is stop and go, are there fish here? And am I putting my baits where they can see them? If you're not catching fish, don't start changing colors. That's not going to make a difference. Yeah, that was kind of one of the things that uh, I, I took in when I was at the the big walleye weekend uh, in Dunkirk a couple of years ago was, uh, you know, kind of learning when to, to shift gears and when to, to start making changes and what those changes should be. And I think that's something that, um, you know, as we talked about a little earlier, I think people make the mistake of is they they do the wrong thing for too long yeah and they, and they try to make adjustments that don't matter right because if, 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 you, if you're not in the right place i don't care what color lure you have i don't care what your lure looks like it doesn't matter um so working from the top am i in a place where there's fish how deep are those fish do i have my lures at the right spot so we we call this uh this depth of lure we call it the box of death so every day that's going to change some days you got to be within a foot or two of the of the, of the fish to catch them some days that box can be 10 feet, right? It doesn't matter. We call it the box of death. And once you figure out that box of death and where your baits have to be, now you stay over those fish and now you start changing lure speed. And I'm a fast troller. I catch I catch probably 80% of my trolling fish, even, listen to this, guys, even in water temperatures below 50 degrees, I probably catch about 80% of my trolling fish somewhere just under or just over three miles an hour. Uh, I am a fast troller. I think lure speed, fast triggers fish that are inactive a lot better than going slow does. Got a lot of experience, a lot of records that say that. There are days I have to go slow, but I don't go slow until the fish tell me I have to. A lot of guys start at one four, one five, catch a fish, and they stay there. And I go buy them at, at two eight, two nine, three, and I catch four times as many fish, not because I'm a better angler, but because I cover more water and get past those fish more often. And think about it. Here's my analogy. Let's say you're sitting around Thanksgiving afternoon. If you live here in Michigan, uh, you know it's six o'clock, seven o'clock in the afternoon. You're done. With, you're done with Thanksgiving dinner. The lions have already lost. You're sitting there. You know you, you got your pants on done because you just can't eat anything else. And somebody comes around and says, "Hey, would you like another piece of Aunt Mabel's pecan pie?" You're like, I can't eat anything else. No. All of a sudden, your ten year old nephew comes around the corner and throws a football at your face. What do you do instinctively? Whop. That's what I think fish do when they're inactive. You try to put something in front of them, a little worm or a little leech, and the fish like, don't care. You put a crankbait past them going two and a half, three miles an hour, and it's making noise and it's rattling. And they're like, what in the heck is it? Sometimes they'll grab that bait. They don't want to eat it. They just want to know what it is. So I think speed is an underutilized thing. I think high speed is an underutilized factor for triggering inactive fish. So once we get our lures at the right depth, that's the box of death. We figure out how fast we can go. So every time we catch a fish, we go a little faster, a little faster, a little faster. At some point, the fish will say, no, nope, can't go any faster. Okay, fine. So now we figured out our speed range. Then we start doing this. We put different lure sizes, lure shapes, and lure actions at the right location, at the right depth, at the right speed. And we let the fish tell us, hey, I want a three inch long, long bait today, as opposed to a five inch fat bait today. Then we start to work through the size, then the shape. And then once we get all that figured out, then we finally start dialing in the color last. 
So if guys would just kind of slow down and, and work from the top down, and I ask a lot of guys the first time I show this, you know, my first question is, look at that list. It's in order of importance. My first question to everybody is, do you fish backwards? And most guys are like, mm, yeah, I, I fish backwards. So we're trying to get guys to kind of flip the narrative, start up here and work their way down and understand that each one of these is much more important. And if you do that, you know, especially back to Rick's question, that's the secret. The secret is the secret is to have a process. So now what happens, Chris, is if you do something wrong, if you go through a pot of fish and you go through them at 2.5 and they don't bite, that's okay. You know, 2.5 doesn't work. So you either go faster or slower. At some point, you're going to get the right speed. If all this is right, at some point, you're going to figure that out. So it's figuring out each step, ticking off the box. And the guys who catch more fish are the guys who can do all of this faster, get to this point so they can dial in. Because I've never said color isn't important. I have said color is not important until everything else is done. So the faster you can get to the little details, the more fish you're going to catch. But a lot of guys don't spend the time taking care of the big things so they can start concentrating on little details. They worry about the little details first when they're not even ready to start worrying about them. Yeah, it's kind of almost like a sales technique. You're going to eliminate the no's and, and, and get get to the yeses, yep. and that's kind of, kind of how you go about it. And um, we do have a couple questions that kind of get into what you just said. Sure. And, and I believe that, that all of life's problems can be solved by anything that gets said in the movie Talladega Nights. And Ricky Bobby says, I just want to go fast. Just want to go fast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Colin, Colin Girk, uh, he wants to know, what's the prime speed and water temp I should be watching my fish hawk for when it comes to late season or summer walleye? Good question, Colin. Um, so let me back up. I am not a water temperature guy unless there is bait. So let me kind of explain that. I believe that walleyes will live out of temp, out of depth in water that's too clean, too dirty, too hot, too cold, too calm, too windy, if that's their only option for bait, okay? The walleyes worry about one thing. Once they're done reproducing, their whole life revolves around where's my next meal. A walleye's not gonna live in 68 degree water, 65 degree water, swim up to 80 and eat and go back down. If all the bait's in 80, the walleyes are gonna be in 80. Now, if I could pick an ideal for this summer transition, you know, summer to, into fall, um, as the water temperature likes to cool cool down, I start looking for 64, 65 degrees. That's kind of perfect. Walleyes like that little cooler temperature if you have bait that lives in that temperature. So my first thing is part of this location is knowing what kind of bait fish live in your lake and where they're going to be. So I always look for bait first. And then if I have multiple bait options, I start looking for that mid high 60s temperature. That's been my best bet this time of year for, uh, for walleyes. Now, as the fall goes on, as it starts getting colder, obviously the little bit warmer water you can find, the better. That's why you know, walleyes move towards uh, inflows and outflows. They move towards uh, shores that get wind because now all of those things are bringing a little bit more warmer water in. But this time of year, 65, 68, if there's bait, that's important. Uh, speed again. I'm a fast guy, um, and I don't care. I can't. I we we fish here on Lake Erie second third week of December if there's no ice. We caught fish last year December 11th. Actually, we caught a 13 pounder last year December 11th. We were 2.9 pulling crankbaits in 44 degree surface temperature water. So um, I think speed again. I I if I could get guys to do anything, it'd be go faster. Um, but whatever your fish hawk says, and I and I heard Chris say I I, I listened to Trevor's. Uh, fish hawk live the other day. Um, I don't care what the speed is on your fish hawk, just do it again. Um, so uh, if you like to troll slow, if you're a guy that likes to troll long skinny crankbaits and you like one four, one five, one six, perfect. Uh, I choose little little fatter crankbaits, you know, like bandits and baits that I can tune and get going a little faster. I fish a little faster, but I will tell you, I am adamant about watching my fish hawk. So I don't care what that number is. I watch my fish hawk and I watch my speed overground on my GPS. When I catch a fish, I don't really care what that number is. I just want to do that number again. So that's the big thing about speed. Experiment. I would tell you as you catch fish, go faster. So my rule is two tenths. If I catch a fish at one six, I put the same bait back in and I go one eight. Catch a fish at one eight, I go 2.0. Catch a fish at two, I go two two. No more fish. I just figured out one six to 2.0 is my speed range. Done. We're over with that part. Check number four off. We're finished. 
So that's the deal with speed. I don't think there's an ideal speed every day. Uh, I will say I don't think guys, most anglers don't get to the best speed because once they catch a couple of fish, they stop. Um, you can't tell me one six is the best unless you went two, two and didn't catch any fish. Does that make sense? Um, too many guys go, ah, oh, we can catch them on our reef runners at 1.6. Did you try bandits at two, two? Well, no. Did you try something else at 1.8? No. Did you try pulling small spoons at 1.3? No. Then you can't tell me that reef runners at 1.6 were the best. It's what you caught them on, but you can't tell me it was the best until you tried something else. So I'm not real specific on those things to sit here and say, here's what you do. I will tell you 100% pay attention to what your speed says. And when you catch them at that speed, do whatever you have to do to stay at that speed. All right, here's a question from Dale, and it goes back to the location end. And Dale says, uh, here you're talking about where the fish are. How long will you motor around looking for fish on your graph before setting down? He says, uh, this year on salmon, he did that first, caught more fish. But it caused some questions about motoring around at 7 to 10 miles an hour looking for fish before setting out. Uh, first question is easy. How long? However long it takes. Um, I've had five-hour charters where we go three hours before we put a rod in the water. Because what good does it do? What kind of charter is it if we're just going to drive around and put lures in the water? So um, I don't, especially in open water. Any, anytime I'm fishing open water, deeper than 10, 11 feet, salmon fishing, steelhead fishing in open water, walleye fishing in open water, chasing open water crappies, uh, chasing perch like we do here in the fall on Erie and, and Lake St. Clair and Saginaw Bay, however long it takes. If it's two hours, it's two hours. Um, there's no sense... I'm not a fisherman. I'm a catcherman. I don't like to fish. I like really easy fishing. Uh, that's why I fish where I fish. Uh, <laughs> you know, again, go back to that analogy. You wouldn't just stop in the middle of the woods and go, oh, I've walked for half an hour. Bang, bang. I didn't shoot a deer. Um, you've got to keep that in your head that you cannot catch them unless you're fishing where they are. I had a friend. We did this seminar one time. Uh, he came to one of our fishing education weekends, and we talked about this, and we talked about this. He goes, I'm going to really practice that this weekend. So after the first day, he comes back. He goes, you need to come look at my boat. And I got in his boat and on his sonar screen, at the top, he had taken a, a label maker. And on the top of his sonar, he put a sticker that said, are there, we call them catchable fish, fish that, are, that, that show that they're active and aggressive and you can catch them very easily. He says, are there catchable fish here? He stuck that on his sonar and he goes, I am learning that the answer is not an absolute yes. I keep on moving. So the answer is however long it takes. How I would rather drive for three hours and catch fish consistently for two than randomly drive around and catch one or two for three hours and maybe never, ever get on the right spot. Um, we're starting to see more of that salmon fishing. One of the beauties about salmon fishing on the west side of Michigan for us, a lot of guys are getting rid of their 26, 28, 30, 32 foot boats. We're seeing a lot more traditional multi-species boats, 18, 20, 22, 23 foot uh, big walleye boats doing more salmon fishing. Well, these these boats are fast, right? They can move 25, 30, 40 mile an hour. Still read their sonar. You should never be able to outrun your sonar. Your you know sonar travels 4,800 feet per second through fresh water. If you've got your sonar transducer correct, and that takes a little bit of work, you get that right, you should be able to go as fast as your boat goes and, and make good fish marks. So we've got more people salmon fishing now who are riding around an hour, hour and 15 minutes, finding a pot of fish, setting down, going back through those fish three or four times with only three or four rods now and catching a limit in three passes, which is three rods in the water because those three rods are always where the fish are. So we're starting to see the days of just randomly driving around and hoping you run into something starting to disappear. So easy answer to the first part of that question is however long it takes. That's 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 the rule on my boat. We don't put, we don't put baits in the water until we know we're there. And now with side scan, I run Laurent stuff, so with side scan, live site, active target, I don't even pull to a place on the Detroit River and start jigging unless I, I know there's fish. So I'll drive around on the Detroit River and go, okay, there's a pot over there. There's 20 fish over there. I'll, I'll mark it, put a GPS on, on my side scan. I'll go back, make three or four drifts, catch six, eight fish, drive back through again. That pot has moved. I'm gone. And somebody moves in and starts catching, you know, starts drifting. They go, where are you going? Like, there's no fish. Well, I just saw you catch eight and two drifts. Well, yeah, they're gone. They're not here anymore. So you can fish here all you want. Take my spot. Um, and I think that is something we have to get anglers to understand is you have to fish where the fish are, no matter how long it takes to find those fish. 
All right, here's one uh, from John Lott. I like this one as well. John says he's a big fan and uh, he loves to see the progression of teaching fishing program. He says, where do you see yourself in the next five to 10 years? Where do you want to be? John, first of all, thank you. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for uh, kind words and all the support. Um, it's funny you say that because I just I just put new goals up on my office wall. It's funny you say that. So a couple of things we want to do. Uh, we want to get teaching fishing to more people. That's number one. How do we use uh, our digital medium to get 500 people watching coffee hour, 1,000 people watching coffee hour? Uh, we want to grow our teaching fishing anglers club, which is our little group that we do um, uh, sp specific seminars for. We have a group that we do content just for them. Uh, we want to grow that to 500 people in 10 different states. So we want to kind of grow teaching fishing. Uh, the third thing that's on my list is actually build a quality, meaningful, long lasting youth education fishing program. Uh, a lot of youth fishing education programs, and I and I give everybody that does it kudos. Um, they hand a kid a rod, maybe they spend 15 minutes showing them how to cast, and then they leave that kid alone, and that kid never touches that rod again because his parents don't fish or he has no access. So I want to really focus the next five or 10 years using my contacts and my resources to build a meaningful program for people that don't know how to fish, be them kids or young adults or parents who've never been fishing. How do we get them access and how do we teach them how to take the kid down to the shore and actually have a good time catching fish? So those are my three goals. Get more eyes on teaching fishing, increase the amount of members we have uh, on the Teaching Fishing Angers Club and create a meaningful, lasting uh, program that actually helps people that don't fish get into fishing, be it kids or be it young adults. Or, you know, we've got a lot of single parents. We've got a lot of single moms. We've got a lot of guys who never... No one took them fishing. How do we get them excited about fishing? How do we get them access? They can fish off the shore without having to buy a big boat. And how do we get them to be the next generation of fishing? So those those are my three goals for the next uh, the next five years. That's that, those are those are pretty simple. Awesome. We've been talking uh, teaching fishing, lots of that type of stuff. But let's get in. You know, you're a charter captain too. You actually go out on the water and and, and actually fish, not just talk about it. Uh, tell us a little bit about your charter. I'm a lot better talker than I am a fisherman. <laughs> um, so I do, uh, I start my season on the Detroit River, um, usually first part of April, April uh, until the week. Uh, I usually leave Detroit River Sunday before Memorial Day. Um, so that's 45, 50 days. I do two trips a day down there. That's where my season starts. I usually take a couple days off and then I head up to Saginaw Bay. I'm up in Saginaw Bay Memorial Day through about the 1st of August, usually done by the first week of August. Well, we take a little break. We're right now in conference season. We're going to some writer conferences and some other things going on. And then we head to Lake Erie about the third week of October. And we're there. We do our fishing education weekend, the first weekend of November. And then we're usually there for about a week after that, doing some guiding and some fun fishing. So um, my charters are all hands-on. I expect you to come on a charter and have questions. Um, I want to teach you how to control the boat, how to read the sonar. Ask me about rigging. Why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, why are we picking the lures we're using? Uh, I want you to be active and interactive and participate in the charter. Uh, I want you, my whole goal in a charter is not just send you home with a bunch of fish. I want to send you home as a better angler. I want you to learn some of the things you need uh, to learn. So that's kind of neat because as opposed to a guy who just says, here, sit down, here's a rod, reel the fish in. I get active and I interact with my, with my customers and you know, jig fish on Detroit River, it's not that hard, but it is complicated, if that makes sense. So, you know, a lot of my guys are, are maybe the new, so I'll bring them right on the front deck with me and I'll physically grab their hand and go, no, slow down your jigging motion, right? And once they get it, there's somebody else in the back of the boat that's struggling. So we'll switch places. A lot of my guys have their own boats. So they want to be on my boat and see how I use my electronics and how I control the boat for vertical jigging. So I'll hand them the remote and go, here, show me what you got. And I'll kind of teach them. So I really enjoy uh, the interaction. I enjoy the anglers that come. I consider a charter a five-hour block of time that I'm fishing with friends. I may have never met you, but you bring four guys to Detroit. By the time we're done, we're going to be five fishing buddies. And I'm going to jab you, and I'm going to find out the guy in the group that everybody makes fun of, and I expect you to make fun of me. And if someone loses a fish, we're going to – I just want it to be an enjoyable experience 
where you get a chance to, I'm going to share with you my experience and my uh, knowledge about the area we're fishing, how we're fishing, and make you a better angler uh, when you leave the boat. That's that's my whole focus when I, when I get in the boat is to make you a better angler and have you leave with a smile. I want you as a customer to be my best advertiser. That's my goal is to make you go, you know what? Tough day today. We only caught you know a few fish, but man, I really enjoyed fishing with Lance. I really had a great time. Can't wait to come back. Can't wait to tell my buddies. So I try to build an experience, build relationships, and um, the fish. You know, I, I, I consider the fish third. Honestly, I do. I consider it an educational experience. I consider it a camaraderie exercise, and then third, I consider it catching the fish. Those are my goals. Uh, when we fish now, most days we catch a lot of fish and that's all part of it. And that's fun of it. But there are days you don't and you can't control the fishing. Uh, what I can control is my dad always says you can't control the fishing. You, you can control your attitude and you can control your effort. And I try to do that and make the trip the best it can be regardless of how many fish we're catching. So, yeah, it's, I my favorite part of what I do is the, is the charter fishing. Absolutely. hundred percent. My favorite part. We're outside. We're fishing. I'm meeting new friends. Uh, maybe showing them a trick or two and honestly learn a thing or two. You'd be surprised what I learned from my customers every year. You know, Hey, we do it this way. We did that way. All right. Show me how you do that. So those little tidbits that I pick up from my customers every year that make me a better angler. So it's a, uh, it's a fun time on the boat. I really do. I really enjoy my time on the boat. All right. You've talked about boats and boat control <laughs> and you've got a couple different boats. So let's, let's talk about uh, the boats that you're running uh, with your charter. So uh, my Detroit River Charters, I run a 20-foot Polarcraft Kodiak. Uh, I've worked with Polarcraft since 2003. Uh, I actually was one of the guys that helped, helped design uh, their tournament boat, their Kodiak boat. I was actually, they actually handed me, I ran, the boat they had was not, <laughs> it was not a tournament quality boat in 2004 on the Professional Walleye Trail. Uh, we found out where it was going to break and not be good. We sat down, winter of 2004, they handed me a couple sheets of paper and said, what do you want to do? So we built the Kodiak from scratch. So obviously I have kind of a, uh, an emotional attachment to the Polar Craft Kodiak. That's what I fish out of on the Detroit River. I ex Extreme boat control, fast boat. Um, even the 200 horsepower Suzuki runs about you know, 50, 51 miles an hour. So I can get up and down the river. I can move. I got a lot of room, a lot of storage. Uh, I love that boat for uh, typical fishing. My open water boat, uh, on the sixth year, I run an Angler Quest Pro Troll uh, 824. So it's a 24 foot, actually a 26 foot decked pontoon, uh, but it's a triple tune, 26, di 26 diameter, diameter, in inch diameter tunes, a triple tune, 200 horse Suzuki on it. Uh, the beauty of the pontoon is I can get more people. I'm getting more kids. I'm getting more women on the boat because they know that if they don't want to fish, they can actually have a comfortable place to sit and enjoy it. I'm getting more grandparents bringing their grandkids. I'm getting more families. Um, and that boat, I'll tell you, everybody looks at a pontoon and goes, you know, everybody has the same misconceptions. It gets blown around a lot. It's not stable. It's, a, it's absolutely 100% false. All those things are wrong. My boat, my pontoon is much more accurate staying on course in a crosswind than any boat I've ever fished out of. Um, think of it this way. If you're driving an obstacle course with a bicycle, it's a lot easier to turn a bicycle than it is to turn a tricycle. And that's what a pontoon is. We have three keels basically that you have to blow it's hard to move three keels you get a regular boat that's kind of focused on one keel it starts to move it's gone it's off course it's really hard to push those three 26 foot keels uh off course plus you get no you, you don't get any roll boat can only go so far on the pontoons it's not going to do this like a regular boat does plus the platform I, I run 16 to 18 rods on a charter i got all kinds of room for rods all kinds of room for people it's comfortable it handles rough water because I'm not pounding through the water. I'm actually on top. Um, I tell guys all the time, send me out Lake Erie. Tell me it's going to blow 30. Let me pick a boat. I would be in my pontoon every day over any other boat that I've ever ridden. And I've ridden in just about everything. So uh, I really do love my pontoon. Uh, it started kind of as a novelty. There's now 41 of them actually in our marina. Uh, there's 41 guys fishing out of uh, Anger Quest pontoons. And you're starting to see more and more and more and more of them. The only reason I don't use it on the Detroit River, a lot of guys ask me about that, is it won't fit in my slip. I don't have enough room in my slip to turn that 26-foot uh, boat to get in my slip. And again, one of the advantages is it doesn't get blown off course. One of the disadvantages is they're hard to turn coming into a slip because you get that same thing. You can't turn them as sharp. But 
Uh, I'm very proud to work with both those companies. Uh, Polarcraft got bought two years ago by um, uh, by Apex Marine, which is the same company that owns AnglerQuest. So I'm working with the same group of owners and builders and people that I absolutely trust and, and love what they do. I know I know their integrity and I know their uh, willingness and their want to build quality boats. So it's really been really been kind of exciting to working with with two great companies and uh, really uh, one of the, two of the last remaining independent companies. You can buy an AnglerQuest Polar Crab, put any engine you want on it. You're not tied into an engine brand. So uh, it's been fun to be part of the process of designing a boat, helping build a boat seeing the changes, seeing why we can do things and why we can't do things. Um, I, I'm really, really proud of those associations. And on both my boats, they do different things. And I'm, I, I love them both. Like, like they're my kids, right? They're, they, you kind of kind of build a relationship with your boat when you're in it as much as I am. And, and you know, it's, it's hard to see them go. And um, yeah, and I, you know, I would tell guys, buy the boat that's best for you. Be honest with yourself when you buy a boat. What am I going to use this boat for 90% of the time? And buy the best boat for that. Don't compromise. Go, well, you know, the wife's going to want to go twice and the kids want to go tubing twice. And I like to bass fish and I want a walleye troll. What are you going to use the boat for? Well, I'm going to go walleye trolling 40 times a year. Buy a walleye trolling boat. You can turn that into a bass fishing boat. You can turn it into a tubing boat. You can put a couple of cushions up front and turn it into your wife, go with you two times a year. Don't compromise when you buy a boat because when you buy a boat to do multiple things, it doesn't do any of them well. So uh, when you're getting ready to buy a boat, figure out what you do most of the time, buy that boat, and then make it do the other things you need to do. All right, uh, Lance, last question, and then uh, we'll let you get back to doing your thing. All right. This one's from Ryan. He says, other than rods and baits, what's the absolute one thing you could not go without on the boat that makes you successful day in and day out? I would not. Boy, that's that's a... It's going to be electronics related, and I'm tr and I'm trying to figure out which one it would be. Um, it's obviously electronics related. I would tell you this: if you if you took so if you're going to pin me down, Ryan, and give me uh, my my easy answer is electronics, sonar, GPS, fish hawk, uh, side scan. That's all stuff that I I can't imagine being on the water without. Um, if you're going to pin me down, if you're really 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 going to pin me down. I would never give up. Uh, I would never give up my GPS. Uh, and the reason I say that is this: some of the places we fish, Detroit River in particular, Lake Erie in particular, Saginaw Bay in particular, some of the places we fish, if you miss a line by one or two boat widths, you will catch nothing. Um, jigging on Detroit River trolling contours or trolling outside edges of weed beds like I do a lot on Saginaw Bay, uh, following underwater currents like we do on Lake Erie. If you don't have a GPS or you just randomly guess, you're going to miss that. And if you again, if you miss it by a boat width or two, you catch nothing. So electronics is the easy answer. Uh, if you had to pin me down to one, I would say I would have a hard time without my GPS. And I, I look at I hardly ever use my GPS to get back to home. Hardly ever. Um, I use my GPS when I fish and I save a waypoint every time I catch a fish and these lines become very distinct. These turns become very distinct. Um, I, yeah, electronics would be the easy answer, Ryan. Uh, if you pin me down to one, I would say I, I, you'd have a hard time taking my GPS from me. I'd let you take my sonar because I can kind of figure that out. It's going to take longer, right? But uh, that GPS being right on that line, right on that number, right on that contour, um, GPS with good mapping, I would take that over any other piece of electronics any day. Well, that's that's interesting. I would have thought you would have said sonar over the GPS. So it's a uh, an interesting answer. All right, <laughs> Captain. Uh, people want to reach you. Uh, how do they do it? If there's anything else, you any parting words you got? Yeah. So you they, they can get a hold of me. Uh, email is uh, teachingfishing at gmail .com. They can get a hold of me. Uh, there's our website teachingfishing dot com. Uh, YouTube page. If you want to watch some of our seminars, some of the stuff we do, you can go to YouTube Teach and Fishing. And then obviously our Teach and Fishing Facebook page. Would love to have the guys Monday night at 8.30 Eastern. Uh, tune into Coffee Hour. Uh, check us out. And the big thing, big thing to me, guys, if, if you really, if you really liked what you heard, please go to our YouTube channel because all of our stuff is there. We have different ways of presenting information. Um, start there, kind of understand what we're all about and kind of how we teach. And if you have anything, teachandfishing at gmail.com. 
um, we are here to help. That's what we do. I mean, our job is to help. So uh, don't ever hesitate to reach out and, and join us on any of our stuff. We'd love to have you. All right, John Lott, uh, give us a private message with your address. We'll get out a little package for you. You're the question of the day. Thanks so much to uh, Captain Lance Valentine for your time and your knowledge, sharing that with our audience. Really appreciate it. Uh, love the We always love having you on the show. Always enjoy it, Chris. Appreciate what you guys do at, at Fishhawk. And uh, hopefully we run into each other pretty soon. It's kind of one of the bad things about having shows is I don't see my fishing family anyway <laughs> as much as I used to. So hopefully we get a chance running into each other here pretty quick. Uh, we're planning on a show that you'll probably be at it maybe in January. Well, I'd like to hear that. That's good so, to hear. Let's do it. Hi, right. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Thanks to everyone for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you next time.